Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the webinar. Um, as Lucia said, it would be nice to make this a, a conversation. So I'll, I'll say a little bit to get the ideas flowing, and then hopefully we might, through questions, uh, move into a conversation. So please do use the chat box wherever you feel you'd like to say something or ask a question, and uh, we'll come back to those. And Lucia has also very kindly offered to put in some relevant links. So if I put something up and you think I'd like to know more, then she can give you some links via the, the chat box. But let me begin by asking you a question. Um, wait a minute. I'm sorry to get my... Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, why do we play? Now, that's quite an important question. If you think about it. Um, if you want a laboratory to uh, remind you about play, just look at any bunch of kids in a playground and it will soon bring it back into frame. But there's a rather important question there. Why do we do it? Because actually, if you think in psychological terms, particularly evolutionary psychology, play takes up time, it takes effort, it's not necessarily productive. So why on earth do it? More importantly, how and why have we evolved as a species to play? Well, there's a lot of interesting answers to that question, but basically and, would it come? Hello? I'm really sorry, you're not sharing your sc um, screen at the moment. Ah, okay, in which case, bear with me. I'll come back again then, sorry. Um, uh, let's try again. Can you see that now? Perfect, it works. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully what I was saying still is relevant. I was just asking the question, why do we play? And basically, it's not a trivial question. We spend a lot of time, play takes up effort and resources. And in evolutionary terms, why would people do it? Well, there are several answers, but typically the psychologists would suggest we've evolved as playing animals because play gives us a chance to practice skills which are essential to survival. And you can see that kind of plays into kids rehearsing the skills, which later on become rather important, whether it's running away from somebody or something else. Practicing skills, probably useful. Um, it's also about learning to cope in a very tricky environment, which isn't just a physically challenging one, it's an emotionally challenging one as well. So we've evolved a capability to cope and to learn how to cope, partly through the process of play. It's a kind of rehearsal to deal with some of these difficult situations. Another really important point about play is it's mostly not a solo activity. It's all about sharing, collaborating. And if you think about that in evolutionary terms, we survived because we got together. We shared protection, we shared ideas, we shared. We had to learn to collaborate. And so play as a way of doing that in a, in a safe way probably quite an important thing to be doing and practicing. And very important for our conversation today, play is all about trying new stuff out, generating new things. Go back to your bunch of kids in the playground and watch the way their games evolve. And then a cardboard box becomes a spaceship and some, suddenly it's a, a house in which people are living. Kids are really good in their play at generating new ideas, creating almost out of thin air. So there's something about play as a way of practicing creativity. Now, these are rather useful things if we think about it and probably help us understand why it is that we have evolved as a species to be playing animals. Now, let's move then from that generally important, why do we play, to the specific question about innovation, playing and innovation. And of course here, we know play is really important. We've got plenty of research now to remind us innovation is hugely about experimentation. It's about exploring the dimensions of a problem. It's about producing prototypes and then using those as devices to bring others into the conversation. A huge amount of what we now see as the, the agile innovation prescription is all about controlled experimentation, playing with ideas. It's also about simulation. One of the great things about play is that it gives us a, a, what I'd call a, a low risk analog experience. It's basically a place where we can try stuff out, we can experiment, but we can also simulate things that might happen. We can ask difficult questions. What if we did this? What about that? We can do it without a direct risk. 
So that simulation element of play can really be rather important in our world of innovation. And hugely, it's about collaboration. And as we know, innovation is a multiplayer game. It's not a solo act. So learning how to collaborate, and in particular, I'd call it rehearsing for creative conflict. Actually, if we just brainstorm lots of ideas and everyone says, hey, that's a good idea, oh, wonderful, yes, 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 that is demonstrably not a very effective way of brainstorming. If we want to get good, strong ideas, we need an element of creative conflict. We have to challenge and knock the ideas into shape. Um, look at the wonderful story of Pixar, the, the movie company. There's a, a great book called Creativity Incorporated. But in the book, Ed Catmull, who is one of the directors, describes Pixar's process. That absolutely is not a process where everyone says, yes, 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 and they create great films. It's a fight every morning. It's a controlled fight, it's creative conflict, it's hugely about group dynamics, but towards the purpose of achieving innovation and their movie track record speaks for itself. So what you have there is again, the idea of collaboration and playing allows us to practice that, to rehearse for these creative conflicts when the stakes are lower. So some very good reasons why playing sits center stage in the way we think about innovation. And this thinking, of course, is becoming increasingly mainstream. If we think about, as I said, the idea of agile innovation or the lean startup, at the heart of that is the idea we don't just have a wonderful idea and make it happen, we try it out. We create prototypes, minimum viable product or whatever, and we try that out. And people react to it and we learn. We're constantly in a process of experimentation. And there are plenty of books with those sorts of titles, including one which says experimentation matters, serious play, the playful entrepreneur. These are all books, guidebooks, which help us see just how important innovation, how important play is to innovation and how it's increasingly becoming something at the center. We also get the idea of what I would call play time. 3M is famous for its 15% policy. It's something that's been written about greatly, but basically for a very long time, 3M recognized that you don't just ask people in innovation to do stuff, you allow them some space, and their estimate was 15%, give them some space and the permission to use that space in any way they want, permission to play, go for a walk, have a sleep, play around, it doesn't matter. And many, many of their breakthrough innovations trace their genesis to that playtime, not least post-it notes, the famous one. What do you do with a sticky, non-sticky glue? Play with it. And Spencer Silver, the chemist who invented it, spent two years using his 15% time playing around. There was no product. This was not part of company policy. They were just playing. Much more recently, Google's had a lot of publicity for its 20% policy, but it's the same principle. Give people space, give them permission to play encourage them to play, not to do the traditional things that they're employed to do, to deliberately go off to the side, to play around at the edges, to experiment. And very recently, we've seen an explosion in what I would call play spaces. Environments for play, they're often these days called innovation labs, because that makes them sound more serious. But what they really are, are play spaces. Places where we're trying to encourage a different kind of thinking. We're often trying to encourage interesting collaborations, bringing in people from outside. Hackathons are a good example of something like that. But in the various different ways we're trying in place spaces to create the kind of environment that we kind of recognize if we went to a kindergarten. Lots of bright colors, lots of stimulating things, lots of things to play with, that get the juices going. Essentially, what's going on here is the use of those kind of principles in a grown-up space, a play space. And we're seeing a great deal more of that. So play is becoming much more mainstream in our thinking about innovation. It's part of best practice. And part of that is also play structures. Now, one of the great psychologists, uh, Lev uh, Vygotsky, talked about scaffolding. When we're trying to understand how children develop, Part of their development is all about them exploring their world and making sense of it. And what helps them is to give them 
scaffolding, a bit like scaffolding supports a building while you're constructing it. So children need scaffolding, methods, tools, artifacts, things that help them learn. And of course, we can apply the same principles to grown-ups in our world of innovation. We're interested in scaffolding, play structures that help support how play could happen and play being a very serious activity. And one of the important elements in that play structure is the game, the idea of games as play structures. Now, games have a, a very long history going back at least uh, five or 6,000 years. We've got evidence in archeological artifacts of people playing games. And they did them partly for fun, going right back to our evolutionary thing. Games are fun. And we know that uh, the brain sends some sort of reward chemicals to encourage us to play. We have fun, we feel good, so we play some more. So games have been around a long time and games have evolved in a number of directions, whether it's card games or sports games or board games, lots of different ways you can play, but games essentially have an important feature. They're structured. There's a shape to them. They're not simply, let's play, there's a form and a structure. And Dave Gray, who uh, runs the Game Storming website and wrote an excellent book about games, he suggests that there are five key principles about games as a structured form of play. First of all, there's a space. There's somewhere defined. In a sports field, it's marked out in white lines on the pitch. It's a cricket pitch or a football pitch or whatever. Uh, there's a space. There are boundaries around it. Those boundaries are not just boundaries in space. There are other things which define a different world. Perhaps one of the key features about games is they temporarily create another world in which different kinds of things can happen. This idea of an, another parallel world, really important in games. And another part of that defining that other world and the space is there are rules. Games are not simply let's make things happen. Games have rules. Sometimes there's a long list of do's and don'ts. Sometimes they're fairly simple, but games are structured. They have rules that govern how they're played. There are many things that help you play the game, artifacts, back again to some of those scaffolding ideas, but counters or dice or other things, they're part of the artifacts that we might use in a game. And very importantly, games have a purpose. There's a winning and a losing element. We're trying to get somewhere. So as Dave Gray argues, and I'd certainly support that, games are structured play, but they are structured. There are rules of the game and other parts besides. So, why are games valuable in our context of innovation? Well, let me just bring out a couple of points. The first is this idea that it's a laboratory to allow exploration, something we know is important in innovation, but it's a safe space. We can try stuff out, we can get things wrong, we can fail. Games are all about play, and in that safe space, we can elaborate and we can play safely. It's also what I would call a, a quarantined simulation. Now, what I mean by that is we create an artificial world, an alternative world in a game, and in that game, we can take some risks. Failure could even be fun. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but failure is okay. We can also challenge some taboos. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, a game I play often with my students uh, involves teams of students getting together to create a car. Now, they're not going to create a real car. They, I give them bits and pieces, some cardboard, some balloons, some elastic bands, some, strings, some materials. And I say, OK, you've got an hour. And in an hour's time, I want you to have created a car that will drive itself. Now, that's an innovation challenge. It's new product development. I give them a couple of parameters. But basically, the teams are competing against each other to try and create something to hit that and they want to win the prize they want theirs to be the one that's best so it's a game it's a game in which they take crazy risks because it doesn't really matter and when we come to the demonstration of these cars most of them don't work or they go around in circles or the balloon that was supposed to drive them deflates and nothing happens lots of stuff and it's fun we laugh it doesn't matter but of course there's learning about the possibilities of failure and the possibilities of learning through that Another kind of game which starts to be more interesting is role play. Now, role playing is an important suite of games. There are a lot of role play type games. And as a way of helping people explore challenges in innovation, 
that's useful because when you're playing a role, it's theater, it's not real, it's people acting out something that's a simulation. And what can go on in that simulation can be quite emotionally tense, can be challenging, can be saying things that in the real world we might have trouble doing. So in that kind of space as well, that kind of quarantine simulation that a game represents, we can do some difficult stuff. So safe experimentation, quarantine simulation, and it's also about rehearsal. Playing games allows us to develop experience and practice what we would do in a real situation. Just like in a theater, and remember in a theater we're rehearsing for a play, but just like in a theater, the rehearsal process explores and gets better at it before we perform. So games can be a powerful experiential way of doing that rehearsal. Um, and it's fun. The whole thing about games is they bring people alive. They motivate partly because as we know from neuroscience, it's working with what's been embedded in us for thousands of years, the way our brain works. We want to play because playing helps us learn to survive. So we get some of those reward chemicals to do it. So games are fun and motivational to drive some of this other stuff. So games can be pretty valuable in the innovation context. So let me now do the commercial. This is an Erasmus Day presentation, but let me introduce something called the Gamify Project. And at this point, hopefully Lucia can put uh, some links into the chat. So if you want to know more, you can follow them. But Gamify has been a project which is coming towards its end now, but it involves a number of players. It's formerly an Erasmus Plus Knowledge Alliance. So it's bringing companies, universities and other educational players intermediaries, a number of different people, you can see some in the corner of the screen, and they're coming together, essentially, the objective of Gamify was to advance gamification for innovation and entrepreneurship. In other words, to look at where and how we could use these ideas of games in a more systematic way, and how we might work with them. Um, part of the project was exploring the field, what do we already know, capturing current experience, capturing best practice, trying to get a sense of what's going on, how are people using games, and how do they use them well? Uh, also, who's written stuff so we, don't in, so we didn't in reinvent the wheel, because one of the things we tried to do, particularly with the industrial partners in the project, was develop some games. The idea of games as structured learning, play processes, which can support innovation, developing a series of games. And if you're interested in those games, I'll give you some more details in a minute, but they are all available on the Gamify website together with a great deal of further information. And what we're really trying to do at the end of the project is to deliver support for people who want to deploy games and a gamification approach, whether they're teachers or coaches, whether they're in industry or universities or schools, essentially, how could we support their activities to use games? We're producing a book. We've uh, uh, got an extremely impressive website. Thank you, Lucia, but that website's constantly growing. We've got webinars like this one, podcasts. And one of the things we're hoping to do is to have access to a games library, a kind of supermarket where if you think I'd like to use a game for X, you can go and take something off the shelf. So keep in touch and we'll keep you posted. But essentially the project is trying to advance the ideas of gamification for innovation and entrepreneurship. Particularly, I mentioned we've been trying to develop and test out a number of games with our industrial partners. Um, and these are picking up hot topics. Very early on in the project, we did a, uh, a review, a series of interviews. Where are the needs? <clears throat> Where would you like to find a game? And one of the big issues, not surprisingly, the surface is sustainability is coming absolutely center stage and innovation is going to be a key resource to help us deal with that challenge. How can we create a game which helps us explore that? One which at the time when Gamify started, was an interesting question, particularly posed by 3M, who were the partner there. How do we manage innovation in the context of remote working? Well, of course, you don't have to be a genius to see just after we started, COVID hit, and suddenly that question is really center stage for businesses. How do we manage innovation when we are, because of this terrible pandemic, 
forced to work remotely. So again, how could we explore doing that in the context of a game? Some of the old chestnuts, how do we develop a customer first orientation, particularly across a large workforce? So we get this idea that users and customers are central to innovation. How can we engage that in the minds of our employees? Again, could we try gamification as an approach to doing it? Business models and particularly reconfiguring business models and value propositions within them, another area hugely important and one which lends itself to a gamified approach. And how do we overcome the many barriers to creating value from our ideas? An absolute core question in innovation and one which lends itself again to people playing games to help explore, identify and rehearse how they might deal with some of those barriers. So they're the kind of games we've worked on particularly. And as I say, if you're interested in more, please check out the website. Please chase us up for more details. Just drawing this towards an end and then we'll open up the conversation. I've talked a lot about learning to play and why that's becoming central and important in innovation. We can also flip that and think about playing as a way of helping the learning process. And that really is an important aspect, which as a teacher, I've been spending all my life in different contexts, trying to help students, both practitioners and students who are fresh from their school days, but essentially helping a wide variety of learners understand some of the principles in innovation. And for me, games are a key part of that. Um, they can help learn in all sorts of different contexts, not least they can help us move away from the classroom, the more structured and learning environment, and into very different spaces. Games have a big advantage. They're very portable. I remember in one particular context, I was working in, uh, uh, in South Africa or in Botswana in Southern Africa um, with a group of people who we were working on the idea of continuous improvement, Kaizen, and trying to do some stuff with them. And we encountered a problem because there was a big workforce who were keen to be trained, but unfortunately none of them spoke English and a third of them were illiterate. Mine workers drawn from all over Southern Africa. How can we help them learn, play a game? Because a game doesn't need language. It's a game people can quickly get as a human thing. It's very much embedded in the way we work. It was a powerful tool and a powerful reminder. Games are very flexible, very portable for different contexts. Um, Actually, we use games. They're pretty much already there in our learning repertoire. Um, if we want to warm people up, wake people up, if we want to raise the mood, if we want to have some fun, in a sense, games, as part of the many other things we do, have already been around for a long time. And their value is that they're energizing, they're diverting, they're stimulating, they're fun. They're a different way of learning not necessarily better, but certainly different to formal lectures or project-based work or some of the other things we can use to enable learning. Games are a key uh, complement to that. And I think my experience as a teacher, as a coach in various situations, there's an increasing role for them. There's a lot of talk, for example, about the flipped classroom. And the idea of the flipped classroom, if you're not familiar with it, very simply, instead of broadcasting knowledge to learners um, and hoping they'll absorb it, you give them the knowledge and videos or books or something, they learn away from the context and then they come together having questions, having queries, whatever, but they come to the lecture not to be broadcast at, but to explore around the subject, which is a great idea, except what happens then when you have a Monday morning lecture scheduled from nine to 11, but your students have already read or watched or listened to the lesson you were going to teach them? What do you do? How do you fill that flipped classroom? Well, of course, that's a wonderful opportunity because you can explore the topic in many different ways. But one of the most powerful and fun is to play some games, games with a serious purpose. Delivering in non-classroom situations is another place where we might want to use games. I've given the example of the, uh, the Southern African mine workers earlier. Um, working with inexperienced groups, a large number of my students come fresh from school and they don't know the world in which they may well be playing innovation in the future for real. 
How can we bring that world into them? Well, we can perhaps show them a video, perhaps get a guest speaker, perhaps even take them to a factory or an office. But one of the very powerful ways is we can simulate that real world through games. And games are powerful for dealing with heterogeneous groups, different groups who may have only come together for a workshop, who may never have met each other. It's uncomfortable if you're learning with a bunch of strangers. Play a few games, team games particularly, and we can do a lot with that. Now, those are a few of many examples, but games as a part of our learning repertoire are really rather valuable. Um, and we can see this. There's growing interest in using games to help people learn in a variety of situations. Um, and there are communities of practice. Uh, I do recommend uh, you look at Dave Gray's game storming community, not least because it's full of great tips and hints about games and ways to use games. We're seeing new curricula, new ways of presenting knowledge about innovation. Um, very impressive uh, activity based in North America uh, is something called the exec. It's basically trying to teach entrepreneurship experientially. And it's a series, I think, of 11 sessions, 11 weeks of a course, all of which are delivered at the front end through an exciting, fun experience that students can play. And we're seeing a growth in games as products. We're no longer just look buying games to entertain us as the family at Christmas. There are plenty of business type games which are specifically designed as products to help work with innovation. Let me step back, put that into a slightly more formal learning theory framework. Uh, if you don't recognize this, this is David Kolb's famous learning cycle. And for me, it's been my roadmap ever since I started teaching People don't learn just by injecting them with knowledge. They learn through going around this cycle. Typically, they have some kind of experience, which they're not sure about. To try and make sense of that experience, they need to step back and reflect and review what they reflected on and marry that up to concepts that they have or concepts that others could introduce to help them make sense of it. And then they go out into the world, experiment, does that really work, which generates new experience and so on. Think about Cole's model, it's very robust. Uh, basically, it doesn't matter where you start, but it does matter that you complete the cycle. Now, where would games help with this? Well, first of all, a big question that Cole doesn't directly answer, how do you get people started in the first place? How do you motivate people to learn, especially those who don't think they need to learn or I don't want to learn, I've been sent here by my boss. How do you deal with that? One powerful way of getting the game, getting the learning process started is through games. But games also, as we've been discussing, are hugely valuable in the top left hand corner. All right? Games are all about experiment and about generating rich experience in a safe way, in a simulated alternative world way from which we can then reflect and develop concepts. So I suggest that games can fit absolutely center stage with our learning theory and become a powerful part of the way we approach how we enable people to learn about innovation. Okay, I've talked as usual far too long. Let me summarize very briefly and then we'll open it up. I'd like to suggest that games matter. They offer a powerful tool. We have this word in English, pastime. And if you exp expand that, it's really a game as something that passes the time. Life is so long, we just want to play a few games to pass the time. No, I think games are much more important than that. It's not just about pastime. In the context we're discussing, games are really serious and can contribute a great deal to both innovation as a practice in terms of helping us innovate more effectively and in terms of learning about that. In a sense, games offer us a structured, bounded, alternative world, which is a a rehearsal space, a laboratory for innovation life. Critical here, we can experiment safely. We're not going to hurt ourselves. We're not going to hurt other people. We're not going to destroy the company. Games allow us to play with things. And this risk-free quarantine condition allows us to engage with some difficult stuff. As I say, not least with some of the tricky interpersonal stuff that is at the heart of innovation, because innovation is a people-based process. It's not a machine. 
And it's hugely about learning to collaborate as a way of helping make us more effective teams. And increasingly, those teams are not just within organizations, but across organizations. So games have a great deal to offer. And the beauty of it, and nature's hardwired us in this way, there's a lot of motivation to play because it's built in. So we're kind of um, not finding too much resistance in getting people to indulge in play and then to get some of these benefits. So as the title of this seminar or this webinar, learning to play, playing to learn, pretty important. But let me leave the last words to uh, this gentleman. If you don't recognize him, this is George Bernard Shaw, the famous Irish playwright. Uh, he was a pretty smart guy, but he had a lovely quote, which I thought would do for finishing this webinar. We don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. Now, whether that's individually or as an organization, I think that's a pretty good mantra to think about the role that play might have and games within that play structure in our world of innovation. OK, I will stop sharing now and uh, hopefully there's one or two thoughts, hopefully some uh, questions. But now perhaps could we move and spend a little time discussing around this idea of learning to play and playing to learn. And I'll hand back to Lucia to help uh, moderate this, uh, this part of the game. Yeah, John, thank you very much. Everyone, feel free to ask your question in the chat, or you can also unmute yourself and just ask it. But I will start with my first question. I can see that you're a big fan of games, but what are the obstacles, especially when you implement game within organization? Like, what are the obstacles and how do you overcome them? If you can share and maybe someone from the audience. That's, um, that's a great question. I, I, I guess, um... There are a number of them, and I think it's particularly in the context of um, uh, organizations, so virtual companies, real organizations, businesses, public sector, whatever, uh, but also even in the classroom at a university or somewhere like that, uh, where okay, students perhaps are hopefully a little open minded, very often there's a resistance to games. Huh, I'm here to learn something, you're supposed to do the serious stuff, well, I'll waste my time playing. Uh, and I've heard that many, many times. It's tricky. I think, as I've tried to say, we've got a lot going for us because games can be fun, but there is a resistance to playing game. It's hard to draw people in. Um, so I guess a couple of observations there. It's important to um, not overdo it early on. So if we said we're going to spend the whole of today playing, that's going to turn a lot of people off. If we do a, a simple game to start with that maybe only takes 10 minutes. That's OK. It's not a big investment and it might get us somewhere. It might change the mood. But I think to answer your question directly, that's one of the biggest resistances. People don't want to play, so we have to find ways to draw them in. Um, one of the things, of course, particularly in the context of the kind of serious games we're talking about, is to make the game serious enough, not simply let's play and be silly because it doesn't matter, but actually there is something riding on this. Um, one of the games I've played thousands of times, literally around the world, uh, was when I was involved trying to teach the principles of, um, uh, of, of what's become known as lean thinking, lean manufacturing and so on. A huge amount of which is about Kaizen, employee involvement in innovation. So really important. And I took this all around the world to many countries as part of uh, several United Nations programs. For reasons that I've already flagged, a game is a great way, even if you've got language barriers, because people can experience things directly. What I found was that game worked best when it was serious enough that there was you know, quite a lot of riding on it. And it was close enough to the real world that people could see. Oh, I can see how this might apply. And I vividly remember one man, again, this was in South Africa, who was a real cynic. At first, he didn't want to play. So he watched as the other people played the first round of the game. But it was one of those games where I eventually said, no, we want to change the players. And now you have to play. So he very reluctantly played. He was very negative and well, that, that happens. What amazed me was that evening we had a call and it was about 10 o'clock at night. And my colleague and I were in the bar and he said, you have got to come to my factory tomorrow. And what had happened was that he had played the game and something had flipped and he'd seen suddenly that these Lego bricks that we were playing with 
was not too far away from his real factory world and that actually some of the insights that the game was trying to demonstrate suddenly fell into place and he couldn't sleep and he'd started to sort of uh, begin to think how he was going to change his factory. It became a wonderful example that we could take other people to to show them what could be done in a real factory. But for me, that was the, the flip that can sometimes happen, even with the most cynical person. But you know, so it's a, as usual, a long answer. I think that's one of the biggest difficulties. Play is not serious. There's a kind of conflict. We have to try and get acceptance in different ways that play is serious. It can make a difference. That doesn't mean it can't be fun. Thank you very much. We have another question from Daniel. Daniel, would mm -hmm. you like to speak up? Uh, basically, Daniel is asking how much time should you yeah. give your yeah. employees in companies to play and how often, you said not too often, um, should they do it? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and there is no, this is the right answer. Um, I think I talked about it a little earlier on. I think what 3M did, and 3M is a wonderful company, not least because it's learned to innovate over 100 years. It's made lots of mistakes, but it's somehow learned from those. Its approach to innovation is pretty impressive, but their 15% approach has been around a long time. It wasn't just a number plucked out of the air. It was originally, um, how much time do people spend having lunch and taking coffee breaks? And that roughly in a week is about 15%. What it does is not say, use this time and go away and play. It says, you have permission not to be working on the task we've set you, but to play. So it's much more the notion of permission and space and you can do what you want in it than it is a particular fixed number, whether it's 15, 20% or whatever. Uh, having said that, um, yeah, if I were running a business, I wouldn't want my employees to be playing all the time. Um, if I were creating a team whose job is going to be to come up with a radical new product, I might be happy for them to have um, a couple of days in a hotel doing an elaborate training game where they learned to talk to each other to collaborate and so on i'd see that as an investment uh, equally if i wanted my shop floor team or my call center team to be more customer centric i might do a short simple game as part of a training input for maybe um, a couple of hours an afternoon something like that there is no right answer but i think it's much more legitimating play as a serious activity through which we can learn and generate better ways of working. Uh, thank you very much. You said at the beginning that games are kind of structured forms. So basically, we need to have someone who facilitate them. And who should that person be? And where can they get those skills? Uh, it's a great question. I, I, I think um, I think facilitation of games is important. If you go back to David Gray's, um, what are the sort of, what's the structure of games and so on? Um, games often work well when there is a facilitator, somebody who's making sure people stick to the rules, but also helping people understand them, coaching, guiding, facilitation helps. Um, and I think that particularly is true in the kind of context we've been talking in, in this webinar. So having some form of facilitation is useful, supporting the process of the game. Um, and of course, the bigger the game, the more that could be important. Perhaps with one additional component, um, go back to Kolb learning cycle, games generate lots of experience. Sometimes having a careful, structured, guided reflection, facilitated, can really draw out the learning from this. Um, I remember when I was first learning this kind of trade, uh, a group of managers, 20 tough managers, we were in an old English country house and I'd got a friend in who was a very experienced facilitator to run a session. The game they played maybe took an hour at most. It was a team competition. The, the reflection afterwards took two and a half hours and it was only that he had to train to catch that it wouldn't have taken longer. Really skilled reflection to get things from. So the role of facilitation is important. Um, it's something that often there are professionals able to do this. I go back to the idea of games as product. There are plenty of good games now where a facilitator will come in and run a game for you. And that can be valuable if the game fits what you're trying to do. Um, 
Another thing, of course, is that game can be run once with an experienced facilitator who also trains the trainer. So that kind of handover model is one that uh, can be fairly easily used. With our, our Lego game to teach uh, continuous improvement, to teach Kaizen, what we used to do was come with the game, which came in a, a, our own little box, and deliberately run it with one of the trainers or a couple of the trainers from a company alongside us so that then they could take it, they had the notes and so on, and they could carry on. A simpler version of that and one you can practically try if you've not yet come across the wallet challenge, I do recommend it. Um, uh, you find it should take you to a, a Stanford University website. Wallet challenge was developed with IDEO, the design consultancy, and it's a wonderful way of teaching the basics of design thinking in a game. It's immensely robust, but one of the nice things about that is there's a whole set of facilitators notes and even some videos and so on to help you learn as a teacher to do that. So I think facilitation is important and um, it doesn't have to be always the expert. It can be handed over as well. Um, and where do you search for games? Is there any hub where you find them or do you design your own games? We also have one question. Do you focus on the real world challenge or is it like kind of imaginary problem specifically designed for a game? <laughs> Uh, another great question. We could spend hours on that. Um, okay, basically the idea of gamifying something, anyone can give it a try. Um, it, it, it's not a, a highly specialized thing you need to study a doctorate in. You can try. You, you're basically trying to make fun, to take the essence of something that's important, but put it in that alternative play world and give people a chance to explore it. Um, that said, We've tried, particularly in the book and the papers that come from the Gamify project, to put a little more theory in. And uh, uh, my colleague Henning Breuer, in particular, has been using the principles of, of design patterns as a way of trying to say, well, there are some standard building blocks which we might use to help us assemble a game. So I think there is a, a sort of construction theory, a, a handbook to designing games, which we're working towards um, uh, contributing to. Um, but I go back again, uh, one of the other things I did in, a, I did a lot of this work trying to take the messages of innovation to practice. And we were in, um, in Kazakhstan with a team uh, trying to teach or trying to help managers from companies um, improve their factories. And this was in the bad days when the Soviet Union had collapsed and the Kazakh economy was much smaller. This was a, a fundamental need for them to pivot big time in the way they ran their factories. That was masses of innovation needed. We realized after the first morning that uh, we had an interpreter, but our own interpreter who came as part of the team said, he's not translating anything you say, he's just making it all up. And the other thing we noticed was the managers wrote down everything that was said, no matter what was said. And we realized there was no learning happening. We needed to change. And so we flipped the entire week long course to being games which meant that we had a couple in our pockets, games that we used, but which meant pretty much every night in the bar, we had to think, what are the lessons we want to teach tomorrow? Now, how do we create a game that would do that? Some of them work really well. Some of them I still use. Some didn't work so well, but try it. So in a sense, there's no magic. Um, I think there are um, uh, uh, particularly some of the tools that you can help with. Um, can you make a board game? Well, we all know what a board game looks like. So there you have some reference shape with which to design a game or a card game or a role play game. So there, there are sort of building blocks with which we can play around with creating games. Um, but uh, there's a lot to choose from. You don't have to create your own games. There's a fairly big library already available. Certainly adapt them. But yeah, do have a go if you feel like it to try and create some games. It's fun. Uh, John, thank you very much. We will have just the last question, which is also, also kind of challenge for you, coming from Sonia. She's asking, how would you apply gamification to foster our own creative potential? <laughs> That's a, a lovely you have question. have any games example? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, as I've tried to imply, um, 
it's a challenge, um, particularly to our, a challenge to our delivery style as teachers and coaches. We've got particular ways as academics that we do this stuff. And we were programmed probably, unfortunately, it's a broadcasting model. So we stand at the center of the room and broadcast our knowledge and people write it down and they learn. And of course they don't. So challenging that means challenging ourselves, challenging our approach to learning. Uh, I mentioned, I came across David Kolb's cycle very, very early. I was very lucky that someone introduced me to it because that forced me to think, ah, it's not just about the concepts, no matter how eloquently I deliver them, I need to relate those to people's experience and allow them to experiment with them and play with them themselves. Hmm. And that took me fairly early into looking at, well, can we try some games out? Um, and I was very tentative at first, but it worked. So for me, that became a kind of design template. So my answer to the question would be, try it. Um, Try, think about this flipped classroom kind of challenge. If you had a half hour in your lecture and you had 20, 30, however many students you have, how might you do something differently with them that might be fun, might be challenging, might set up a bit of healthy competition? You know, some of these basic principles, how might you do that? Now, you don't have to start from zero, as I've just implied in the previous answer. There are lots of games on the shelf try it out and it's very often a very different way that generates all sorts of stuff that you hadn't expected to certainly for me one of the great things about a game is if i sort of give a lecture and even with my best most bravura performance i then say any questions i'm only going to get two or three hands raised the braver ones will offer something if i play a game and then we move to the reflection phase i find it really hard to switch them off there's so many things coming out that the game has generated. So it's a way of unsticking ourselves and our teaching. I find it very liberating, probably guessed from the way I've been talking, but I'd certainly recommend it. And yeah, it's a nice metaphor, this idea of writer's block, academic's block. Give it a try. Um, John, thank you very much. And thank you very much everyone who attended the webinar.